Plus Super Study, I'm a senior RTS, uh, and this is my Lua talk. Um, so I did Lua for my game 200 and my game 300 um, games, and this is what I have to say about it. Um, so first of all, what is Lua? For those of you who don't know, it's a small, it's fast, it's a really powerful scripting language. It's written in C, and it's open source. Um, which means that you can modify it, which is really nice. And there's a library called LuaJet, which makes it super, super fast, um, which means it's really, really good for games. Um, it's a dynamic language, which means that you can just have your scripts that control all of your game objects, and you can modify them at runtime and reload them uh, without having to like recompile your engine or even restart your engine, um, which makes it really good for iterating. Um, some of the really cool features of Lua, um, the top one has to be coroutines. Um, so a coroutine is basically a function that you can just stop running in the middle of it, and then um, the next time you call the function, it'll resume exactly where it ended off. Um, so like this function right here, this update, it'll print out hello, and then once it gets to that yield statement, it'll jump out, sort of like returning from it. Um, then the next time you call update, it'll print world. So the two calls to update, the first one will print hello, the next one will print world. Um, that one's pretty useful, but it becomes even more useful when you replace it with a function like this, like wait seconds. So now you can have sort of like an AI function that just has all the behavior that you want in a game object and just sort of script it like you would say it. So you could make something as simple like, hey, object, go over there and then wait a second and then come back. And your code would look like that because you just put the code for it to walk over to a spot and then you could wait and as long as your main loop is continuing calling that, you can just like iterate over DT, figure out when a second's passed, and then do the rest of your logic, which is super awesome. Um, the next cool thing is flexibility. Um, the biggest thing about Lua is that its core feature is tables, which is just an associative array of keys and values where both keys and values can be pretty much anything in a language. So it's really easy to quickly prototype whatever you want because pretty much anything you can describe as a table. So like your game object is just a table with a bunch of floats as values. So you could just have like the string x and y for its position as floats. Um, and it just makes handling everything really nice and flexible. Um, especially even things like methods are just keys on a table usually. So if you just want to like have support something like overloading a method, you can literally just replace the, the function like in the table and it works. Um, which is really cool. So quick example here, it's like creating a game object, it's just a table, it has an x and y and you can return it. And then um, calls the function, gets the game object, and again, since it's a table, you can just put a variable on it, so now it's like a customized game object that has this custom variable in it, um, which is super nice for just really quickly creating what you want. Um, the last really cool thing is LuaJIT. It's written by a guy called Mike Paul. Um, it's a just-in-time compiler, which basically means that he took out the entire VM of the normal Lua, which is basically just a giant switch statement that figures out which instruction you're gonna do and jumps to it. He replaced that entire thing with assembly, so it's really fast. Um, and this makes Lua pretty nice for games because it removed, like, it's one of the fastest scripting languages out there, if not the fastest scripting language out there. Um, so pretty much anything you write in it is gonna be fast, so you don't really have to worry about performance too much. Um, so first thing I'm gonna talk about is meta tables. So meta tables are the pretty important thing that you're gonna to need to know if you want to bind something. They're sort of how you extend tables from just this plain associative array into something that more resembles like a class um, that you would use in C++. Um, so everything in meta tables are described using these underscore underscore functions. So for instance, you have the underscore underscore add, which is the function that takes two objects and then um, you know, adds them or do, does whatever logic you want. Pretty similar to operator add in C++, it functions about the same. Um, you have this handy function set meta table, which basically tells the table that it should use this meta information to describe it. Um, you can see here, you can have numbers, you print it out, and it would be three. Um, but the most important ones for meta tables are the index and new index meta method. Um, so both of these are basically called, when you have a table, and you try and do something with a member of that table that doesn't exist. Um, so index is triggered if you're trying to get a value that doesn't exist, and new index is the um, thing that it calls if you're trying to set a value that doesn't exist. Um, so here is a quick example of the index. So we have a table, we have our meta function, um, and the meta function, the index meta function basically checks to see if you're trying to get a number, um, and then it returns five. 
So we set the meta table, and if we print a dot number, it'll be five. And then we can see if we actually set number to two, and then we try and print it out, it gets two. So again, just kind of reiterating that if you have a meta table, it only works if it can't find the value it's looking for. Um, but it's really handy, um, again, for like emulating classes. Um, new index, pretty much the same thing. If you're trying to set number, um, then we can raw set number to a value plus, plus five. I actually used this trick um, in a game jam that I was working in, where basically we had a bunch of game objects, and when we spawned, um, we had a bunch of mini games, and when we spawned the mini game, the mini game, the game objects might have been offset. So I just threw a new index on there and basically said, hey, every time we create a game object and try and set its position for the first time, just make sure it's within the bounds of the mini game so that it doesn't go off screen. Um, you can do little tricks like that, and it works really well. Um, but the main use for it is in a binding language, if you, you can use these to emulate classes by just having an empty table and then putting a meta table on it. Um, as long as you never write to that table, every single, like, write and uh, get will go through your meta tables. So for instance, right, if you had a new index for setting, as long as you never actually put that information in the table that they're giving you, it'll never find it, so it'll always keep going back to the new index because it's always acting as if it's trying to set it for the first time. Um, so now I'm gonna go into uh, basically Lua in a bunch of different game engines that I've either worked on or have researched. Um, so the first one is Crystallite. This is the engine that I used for my game 300 um, all the way through 375. Um, how we used Lua in that engine was uh, instead of having like entities, we had scriptable components very similar to Zilch and how they sort of structure their, their components. So we had a file that looked a bit like this with our uh, initialize function that we guaranteed to be there. And then we registered events where you can just pass in the name of it and then the function that it's going to call and then that function would get hooked into our main event system and calls every frame um, in the case of the update function. Um, so this was our main way of just plain interacting with game objects. We had game objects and then one of the types of components that you could put on it was a scriptable component of pretty much anything that we made and this was uh, a majority of the functionality that we coded. Um, by the end of Crystal Light, we had about 110 scripts um, for components, all the different functionality that we needed. Um, another cool thing that we did was we used entire files as sort of entities to script. So uh, in this case, we have this weapon. And how we implemented it was we basically had uh, one core script that had all of the base functionality that um, uh, like an actual script component could call into. So we could have a script component that said, hey, I want to use this weapon to use its primary attack or use its secondary attack. Eventually, it would trickle down and try and call an overloaded function. And this function was overloaded simply by just running this file um, and passing in uh, basically the, the main table that we created. And so once we ran this file, it would get the, the table of the weapon that we were overloading, um, set all the data on it, and then it would take these functions and since weapon already had this like on primary that was blank as a placeholder, it would replace it with the code that actually did it. Um, and at the end it would return it so that the, the script that called it could get it. And this actually worked really well because we could just have an entire folder that basically, a uh, simple for loop to just get all the files and run each one. And then we'd have a sort of, you could have a structure in the background very similar to like C++ inheritance where you have this structure in the background of functions that you know are going to be there and then they call into overloaded methods, and this is sort of how we, we did it with that. Um, the next engine that I worked on um, for a game jam is known as Love2D. Um, super awesome little library. Uh, it's a 2D library, and the interesting thing about Love2D is that it doesn't have, it's really not a game engine at its core, it's more of just a library to draw things and update your you know, program. So it, provides you with three functions. You have your load function, your update function, and your draw function. And that's it. That's all it provides you. And so if you want to draw something, you actually use like love.graphics.print or love.graphics.square. Um, and you interact with the engine in that way, where instead of um, in like a lot of engines that you may be familiar with, you actually create like a game object and put a sprite component on it and that sprite component internally like renders it and provides information to the graphics card, but Love2D takes a different approach 
where if you want to interact with the engine in any way, whether it be drawing to the screen or like playing a sound, you use it sort of just as a library where you call a function and you provide the information that it needs to do that and then it does it. Um, this works out really well. Um, the, like, the main problem with it is that it doesn't have any of that game object or component things, so you do have to write it yourself if you want it. Um, but it ends up being really nice because you have a lot of control over the flow of your program, especially with like drawing objects where um, if you have like any weird issues, you know that it's coming from code that you directly wrote, not something that's happening in the back end because the entire engine is just a library at that point. Um, the third uh, engine is Stingray. Um, it used to be known as the BitSquid engine. This was used for Gauntlet and Magicka 2. Um, it used to be BitSquid, it got bought by Autodesk. Um, and they're developing it now. Um, and they take a similar approach to Love2D in the fact that the engine is sort of like a library, but pr it provides a bit more functionality than Love2D does. So it actually has concepts like game objects. It has like a whole backend rendering system. Um, but it, you can see it looks very similar where you create like this game at the top of your file. This is sort of like the initialization file that you provide Stingray. Um, so you have this initialize, and you actually create like a space, basically. Um, you manually update it in the update loop, and then you manually render it. And again, it provides a lot of the same functionality um, and cool features that Love2D does, where you're basically interfacing in the engine when you need to, but a lot of the flow control is through Lua, so you can really tell like when things are going wrong. It's probably something that you wrote in a script. Um, Another cool thing uh, that I touch on this slide is if you have everything in Lua that's doing flow control, um, it becomes really, really easy to iterate your game because you don't have to compile the engine, right? Like every time you make a new space, will you do that in Lua? So you just save the file and reload. Like at most, you'd have, you might have to close down the program and reopen app, but that is so much faster than having to actually recompile a file, um, especially if you have like a bunch of templates and stuff. Um, in your project. Um, so this is sort of like best practices from what I've seen. Um, I really like the, the Stingray method and just basically pushing a lot of um, everything that isn't like core and really performance heavy. Like obviously you're not gonna write your graphics engine in Lua, that's just not performing um, and it's not gonna work. But anything else that isn't like really critical, you can kind of push off to Lua and you won't see that much of a performance loss and you get the like massive benefit that you can just reload it whenever you want and making your game becomes a lot faster. Um, so I'm gonna go over some like implementation things. Um, so for binding, um, so basically when you're doing binding, you have a couple options where you can either just go and basically implement the bindings yourself by using Lua's um, C API. Um, by you know manually pushing the tables yourself and putting them in the global scope and all that and making sure that it works. Um, or you could use a library like Lua Bridge. I believe there's another called Selene. Um, and so both of those are really good because um, like I say here, I recommend using an open source library because it kind of gives you both of the benefits. So for Crystalite, we used Lua Bridge to bind all of our code. Um, but the cool thing about it being open source is that even though like that's sort of the backbone. It does all the boilerplate stuff that we don't care about, but if we do care about something, we can easily go into the source and just look at how they did it and rewrite it a little bit to better suit our needs. Um, so now I'm gonna go over some of the uh, useful features that you would want um, inside of a binding library. So, the first one is C++ 11 binding options, um, like standard function. This is really useful because there's some instances where like if you have like a lambda function or a standard function, sometimes those can't get down converted to just a function pointer, which means that if it can't get converted down to a function pointer, most things like uh, at least Lua bridge can't actually take that and run it. Um, so putting that option in there is nice. So for instance, what we use the C++11 binding option for is for our variables, um, for our script components rather, we had a section at the top, much like Zilch, where you could declare the variables that you wanted um, to be serialized out to a file um, for this specific component. 
And one of the things that we wanted to do to make that fast is we wanted to hash that uh, string that we used and just use that as a lookup. Um, it'd be really hard to do that like normally, um, or I guess if, if we did it normally, you could put it on your meta table and then when it gets called, you could hash the string and then look it up. But if you use standard function, you could just make it so that every one of those variables just had a different function that it called back to and you use standard bind to pass in the hash inside of the function. So it becomes a functor that actually has the function that you're going to call and the hash already pre-computed. So that means that every time that you call that variable, it just automatically has that hash so it can just look that up and you don't have to pay the hashing cost, you just have to do it once. Um, so that's one good reason to, to have that um, as a binding option. Um, the second one is overloadable constructors and functions. Those are just nice for the syntax um, in your scripting language. Like if you have um, scripting, whether it be you know a designer that's working on it or even you, it's really nice to have the syntax match your C++. So if you call a function and you can pass in like two floats or just one in, you want that to translate over to Lua so that there's no confusion or like really weird function names where it's like the name of the function then underscore the types and that just gets weird. So you want it to be to be clean, so those are nice. Um, then the third one, the ability to intercept index and new index meta methods. Um, this is for uh, to emulate the behavior of tables in Lua. So if you can intercept these from the core library like Lua Bridge, you can make it so that if somebody tries to access a variable that isn't already on your component, you can just add it as like a Lua variable onto your component. And so again, it makes it quick um, to you know quickly prototype a component because you just, you know, say you want a variable and then it's there and you don't have to jump through any hoops to, to do it. Um, so I'm going to do a quick aside for variadic templates because they're awesome and they're really important to make your life easy when doing this complicated binding code. So here I have, uh, this is from Lua Bridge. Um, it's still in there. And if you can look, it's really long. It's like all this and all that. And to give you a better sense of what it is, here it is, all of it. So this is the code that LuaBridge uses um, to call a function. And before variadic templates, you just had to do every single type up to like, I think they do eight. Um, which also means that if you had a function that had more than eight arguments, I'm sorry, you can't call it because they didn't make an overload for it. Um, and here it is with variadic templates. It's like one of them. So you just have your variadic templates here, or your arguments here. It's included in the function, and this goes as many arguments as you want. Um, so learning about variadic templates is really useful for just simplifying the code. Um, and also in the next section, uh, it's gonna be really useful um, just instead of writing like, you know, one argument and then two argument, all the different specializations, um, just learn about variadic templates and it makes things easier. Um, so the basics to variadic templates is it uses this dot, dot, dot syntax, um, which basically represents a packed argument. So like here we have a size T, which is packed, which means that there's you know zero or more of them. Um, and anytime you want to use it anywhere, you put the dot, dot, dots on the other side. So like here, we're declaring this is a function that takes a struct of A, which is also a templated struct, and it takes all of the size T's um, that we have here expanded out. Um, there's the size of dot 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 operator, which gets the number of arguments that are in this, not the actual like size of them. So it doesn't matter if they're ints or anything. Like if you pass, if you templated this function with like one two three, this number would be three because you passed in three uh, different arguments. Um, a really cool thing that you can do with variadic templates is that if you call a function and then put dot 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 afterwards, it calls this function that many times with each argument. Unpacked. So again, if you called this function with one, two, and three, it would call other function with one, other function with two, and other function with three. Um, and then this is the default way that you use unpack, just like up here. Um, if you want to basically pass the arguments down, you have to unpack them. Um, so now I'm gonna get into overload functions and basically how you would implement them in sort of a, a script binding um, interface. Um, there's going to be a couple points where I use LuaBridge, but for the most part, this code is fairly generic. Um, and pretty much up until the end, it works with pretty much any script binding system that you have. Um, so some of the problems that you like first run into when you're thinking about this problem is that um, 
you have this function, and of course the compiler knows like which one is different, but you need to figure out how you can get, first of all, how you can assign a unique ID to a name, so that way you can distinguish which function you wanna call, and then you have to go and check each argument to make sure that it matches up with the type that's passed in to make sure that you're calling the right function. Um, so to start out, you make a class that looks kind of like this. This is a simple struct for overload method calls. It takes a class, um, the class that the overloaded function is on, um, the ID, the unique identifier that's going to be a part of it, <coughs> the signature of the member function, and then all of the arguments that that member function takes. Um, the first function that you need is just a, a simple static getter. Um, this is something that will be replicated for every single instance of the uh, templated struct. Um, so each templated struct will get its own static variable, which is just to hold the member function uh, that it needs. Um, the next thing that you need is, is a function that looks kind of like this, where you basically, this is a function that actually gets the arguments and the function pointer. Um, so you have a method overload, it returns a method. This is the syntax that we used for the meta system in Crystallite. Um, it takes an ID, the class that it's on, the return type, and all the arguments. Um, if you declare it like this, you'll be able to get all of these um, different uh, template arguments out of the uh, type of the function. So you have the return type, and then the member function pointer, and then the arguments. Um, and this is just the class that you saw last time. We decal type the func to get the function type. Um, we call the static, uh, this, the static function to get this member pointer and then sign it. Um, so the next thing that we, now we have this uh, struct that holds all of our member functions. And now we need a class that takes the class and ID and loops through all of them and figures out which one it should actually call. Um, so just like the other one, it needs to be, uh, it has these two static functions. Um, it takes the classic Lua um, call uh, signature, um, which is the returns and int, um, and it takes a Lua state. We have a vector of these, and we have a static function to push, um, so we can just gather up a bunch of uh, function this functions that it's going to try and call. Um, and then here is the call function. Uh, pretty basic using a, a range-based for loop. It gets all the functions. It tries to call it. Um, we say that if the return is greater than or equal to zero, that means that it it actually succeeded. It either succeeded and said, no, I don't have any arguments to push, or it succeeded and pushed some arguments. In either case, we want to return out because the function's been called, so we must have found the right one. And at the end, we error out um, to, to say that we didn't find an overload function. Um, so now we need all of the different uh, structs that we're going to use to check to see if the type is correct. Um, so this is the base case um, for our type checking, which is basically if, uh, how this is going to go is we're going to have this base case and then we're just going to use template specialization to get each different type. Um, but the base case, if we don't have any other type that it matched, it's probably a user data, which is basically a, a pointer representing your class. So if it's a user data, we just want to use the, um, this is Lua bridge syntax, um, but we want to check to make sure that it's that same type. So Lua bridge has the is class, where you pass in the, the Lua state, the index that it's at. Um, this is just the syntax for Crystallite's meta system to get the um, key that uniquely identifies the class. Um, and then this is for um, derived classes. So we check to see if if it's the class we want, um, and then we return if it is. Um, here are what some of the other ones are going to look like. So just classic template specialization. You have your template, you specialize it on each type. Um, here's all the types down here that you're going to want to specialize. Um, and don't forget to do both of these because we did that and then somebody passed in a character pointer and it thought it was a user data and it broke. So you want to have both of these, uh, both the, the character pointer and the constant character pointer. But they both loop look like this um, using the Lua is syntax for all the different types. So is Boolean for bools, is number, um, is string, stuff like that. Um, and then we need, so we have all of these individual ones that will check one index on the stack to say, is this the type that I think it is? Now we need just a simple little struct to basically gather all of those up and say, okay, did every single one of you return true that the type that you checked was correct? 
Um, and to do this, we basically use a, a recursive function with um, variadic templates. So you can use this trick where you basically take one argument and then the rest of them. Um, so like here we have the first one and then all the other ones. And so this one is basically the one you can think that you're popping off the stack and then you call the same function with these args. And you can think of the expansion in variadic templates much like the expansion in macros. It just kind of pastes it in. So when it calls this recursively, it'll pop off one of them and then get all the other ones. Um, and then we just have the base case where it doesn't actually have any arguments and we just say true because we don't care about it. Um, so this will loop through, basically, if you pass in any number of Booleans, it'll loop through all of them. And if they're all true, it'll return true. Take a sip of water. Um, so before we go on to the next part, there's a couple of helper classes, or there's a few helper classes that we're going to need. Um, basically, just to hold a lot of information that we're going to pass to all like these uh, that we just made because if you notice they need the the index that it's at and the type that it is and so we need to get and basically contain all that. So the first thing that we need is the simplest struct. It's a stored args. It doesn't have anything in it but it has a template and it has all the arguments that it's holding so this just it's literally for this to get all of the different arguments. Um, this next one's a bit more complicated. It's an indices builder and basically how this works is you pass in um, a number here and it basically segments. So if you passed in the number like five, it would do zero, one, two, three, and four. Um, so this is the basically just a recursive template that eventually gets down and gives you um, indices for the variety templates of every single one um, based off the, the biggest one. Um, and here it is again. Um, these are basically helper classes for these guys so that um, in instead of having to figure out like how many and pass it in manually, you can just pass in your stored args and it'll automatically compute an indices builder that'll work for all of the arguments that it has. Um, and the last one is all these. Um, you can find this pretty much anywhere. This is just to remove all of the decoration on the types. So for instance, if you have a uh, overloaded function that takes a game object pointer, we well, don't really care that it's a game object pointer. It's more important that it's a game object and that's the type that you actually want to check. So this just strips out the pointers and references um, and all the different ones for that. Um, so finally, after all these helper classes, we can get on to this function, which is the check args function. And it's really dense, but it does a lot. So I'm gonna go through each part. So this check args function is a function, a variadic template function that takes the arguments and the um, number for the indices that it's going to check. You can see it takes a Lewis state. It takes our stored args, which has all of the arguments that we want to fill this periodic template section. And then it also has the indices, which are made from the indices builder, that fills out this section of the periodic template arguments. We then call the all true, which was the class that we were looking at just before, which takes a bunch of Boolean values and checks if they're all true. Um, and then we collect the check stack which was the function that was specialized for like the ints and bools and stuff. Um, the type that we pass in is the remove all, which is just this stuff to remove the pointer and reference stuff. The remove all for args, and you can see that we don't unpack it at this state, um, which is important. So we get the, the you know, strip type of that. And then we check, and again, we're using this variadic template, n plus two, we need to move two over in this case, um, specifically with this engine because the uh, function pointer is on the top of the stack and then the this pointer is one up and we don't care about checking those because we know that they're, they're always going to be fine. And finally, at the end of this whole statement, we unpack it. So what this is going to do is for every single argument and index pair that we passed into this function, it's going to pass in the type into this, strip the type, pass it into check stack, Check to see if it's correct by passing in the index that's associated with that argument um, and then adding on to so that it gets the right place in the stack. Um, so really dense, but it does exactly what we need where for every single argument and index pair, it calls the check stack function. That'll return whether or not it's true. That'll all get pulled into this all true function, which will check each one to make sure that they're all true. And then it'll return the result of whether or not they all pass. 
Um, so now that we have this function, um, we can now write the function that we're going to use to call the, um, the actual function. Um, so back in the overload method call, which was uh, the same one that we stored the function pointer on, we have our call function. It takes a Lewis state. Uh, the very first thing that we're going to do is check to see if the number of arguments that we received actually matches the number that was passed in. So there's no use in going through all the complicated code of checking each type if we only had, like, if our function only takes one parameter and we passed in two, there's no point in checking it. Um, so we just do a quick check here. And then down here and after that, we call our check args function. Um, this is where we take our stored args. Since this class has the arguments as part of its um, template, we can use the stored args to gather them up here. And then we use the indices builder, like I was saying, to build the indices um, with all the arguments that we have, uh, pass it in check args, which uh, will say whether or not all the arguments are good. Um, if it doesn't, we return out negative one as sort of an error code that it didn't work. Um, otherwise, this is where it gets sort of um, very specific to Lua Bridge. We'll get our function pointer. Um, Lua Bridge basically has a uh, this function right here, which is just the um, what eventually what it eventually calls when it's trying to call a member function pointer. So it eventually resolves down to this. Um, so this is the function that we're going to need to call um, in order for Lua Bridge to correctly handle the calling of our member function. Um, a specific quirk of Lua Bridge is that it actually uses the up values for Lua um, to save the function that it's going to call. But if we just grab this function by itself, uh, we're not going to have any up values to call. So right here, I just replace it real quick with the function that we want to call. Um, and then we call it and return whatever um, that function normally returns out. Um, and it'll work fine. Um, so all of this is in this call function that we have here. Um, and now, for each one of these overloaded method calls, we can use that, um, if you remember back to the chain call class that was defined a while ago, that's the one that iterates through all of the functions and um, checks each one to make sure it's not returning negative one, um, and then returns once it finds the right one. So we can have our chain call with our class and our unique ID. Um, we get our overload method call with, again, our class, our ID, our member function type, and our periodic argument arguments for the function. Um, so we pass that function pointer into chain call so that it knows that it's one of the possibilities. Um, we get our member function and set it here um, so that the, this specific instantiation knows about the function that it should call. Um, again, Lua Bridge specific code, it's the same uh, function helper. Um, this is sort of how Lua Bridge pushes um, a specific member function that it should call. Um, instead of pushing the member function that we would normally, we push the chain call um, because that's the one that it's actually going to try and call. And it doesn't really matter that it's going to overwrite it every time uh, we call this function because it's pointing to the exact same place. Um, so this would be the code that's actually inside of Lua Bridge um, that determines which function it should call. Um, but we've been skipping over something. So if you remember back here, we have this ID. So what about that ID? How do we get a unique ID that correlates to the name of the function that we want to overload? Macros, of course. So you can use macros to do all the work for you. Specifically, you use a macro like this. So this macro, add overload, it takes a name, uh, two different types, which are going to be the two different types that it's going to try and overload the function with. And you can see that we're uh, calling that function with the line directive uh, macro uh, the type that it's on, the name, and then the specific instance of the function that we want. Um, and this is sort of how it would look like in, in a meta system. Um, so the awesome thing about macros is that with these slashes, this is all in one line. So when it expands, they get the same ID. Um, and so now that, that this bar function, um, both of the calls are routing to the exact same place with this exact same ID. Um, and it's guaranteed to be unique for each different um, overload as long as each of these are on different lines, which is what you're going to do anyways because you're not going to have a bunch of lines of add overload. So it works out perfectly. Um, so just to recap, like from the beginning, how all of this fits together, 
we have this add overload macro that we used to declare the functions. Through the expansion, it gets the, um, the ID and the correct um, functions and passes them in to uh, this method overload function. Um, the args are passed in um, and are generated automatically by the compiler because it can figure that out. Um, the ID is generated with the line directive. Um, once we get into our add overload function, um, it uses the arguments to create this overloaded method call, um, which we pass into the chain call um, in order to notify it that it can, it's a possible candidate for overloaded, or overloading rather. Um, then we get our member function, we assign it into the uh, overloaded method, and then we tell Lua Bridge that if it's going to try and call this function, call the chain call um, instead of anything else. Um, eventually in Lua, you're going to try and call this with some number of arguments. It'll jump to the chain call, and then it'll go through every single possibility um, that you've uh, notified it of. And so each of the functions that it's going to try and call, the first thing that it's going to do is check to see if the sizes match up. Um, and if it doesn't, it'll return out. The next thing that it's going to do is use the, um, the construct the index and type list and then calls the variadic template function um, to actually check each one of the different um, argument ID pairs um, to see if they match up. Um, so the type checking uh, function, it, like I said, it unpacks the arguments and indices. It calls the, the um, specific template uh, to check each different type. Um, each one of those will return true or false, whether the, the type actually worked. Um, and then it'll gather them all up, check if they're all true, and if it is, it'll return out that the types all match. Um, and then lastly, we take the, um, the function that we want and we uh, tell Lua Bridge about it, we push it to up value slot one, and then when we finally call that function, Lua Bridge looks in that up value slot, it gets the correct function, and it calls it, and overload functions work. Um, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is the intercepting variable access. So like I talked about a bit earlier, it's really useful for creating components that you can, uh, again, quickly iterate because that's sort of the point when you're using Lua is that you want to quickly iterate. Um, and something that's nice is you don't want to have to, like I said, we had that header section with all the variables that we wanted to be serialized, but there's a lot of variables that we had on the component, like internal counters, that we don't want to be serialized, and we also don't want to have to add it to the top of the file and then reload the whole engine when we're just adding a variable that we want to use. Um, so this is the uh, section where you can basically intercept that and create variables on your own. Um, so here's an example from Crystallite where we have our event. And we can say something like this.timer equals one and this.passTimes equals an empty table. And so obviously this Lua component won't have timer or pass times on it, but when it looks to uh, see if, you know, when it tries to assign it, it'll realize it doesn't have it and then call back our custom function in order to add these variables onto the component. Um, so the implementation is, is pretty basic. Um, it is very specific to the library, so I'm going to give an example with Lua Bridge because that's what I used. Um, but this is basically what you need. So like I mentioned in the beginning, you have this index and new index. Um, and eventually, if you're using a library or writing it yourself, you're going to have this core loop that uh, basically emulates your class where you get this call, we'll say to index, so you want a variable from your class. You're going to have to look at your meta table, look or look through your meta information and figure out if you have that variable and then if you have that variable, how to push it back into Lua. Um, so inside of that core loop, basically if you trigger the new index and the variable doesn't exist, you invoke um, your custom setter and then if the index is triggered, you invoke the getter before any other lookup. Um, so this is Lua Bridge's basic code um, it looks for a prop set, um, which is its sort of internal table to figure out all the variables that you can actually set. Um, if it doesn't find it, it looks at the parent to support inheritance. Um, and then if it doesn't have a parent, it'll basically keep, or if it has a parent, it'll keep looping in on itself, but eventually um, a table won't have a parent and it'll error out. Um, so this is the 
So inside of here, right, um, this is the, the setter. Um, so this is the new index meta method. Um, so right here, right before it's about to error out, um, we can be safely assured at this point that it's looked through every single possibility on your class and it hasn't found anything, um, which means that the variable doesn't exist. So we can put code that looks something like this in here, where basically we pop off the meta table or the, the table that it was currently looked at and we need to re-get the meta table because it was looking, if it had inheritance, it was looking at the parent's meta table and we wanna make sure that we get the base one um, because that's where our, our custom property is going to, to be on. So we get the, the base meta table, we get the prop set table just like Lua Bridge would, make sure it exists. Um, and then you can look for some sort of key that is basically reserved for you that you know that nothing else is going to use. So you can use underscore underscore. Um, in my case, we use prop custom, which is just a, again, a custom function that would write the, it, it's like any other um, Lua function. Um, as you can see, so in this inside, it expands out into here. Where we make sure that it's a function, we push the, the variables and we call it. Um, so this is just uh, a Lua function, basically a standard one that you know uh, returns an int, and takes a Lua state, um, and internally it would just look at the stack and look at the uh, the variable that you were trying to set, um, create a Lua reference of it, and then just save it somewhere on the class with the uh, name of it on it, so that next time when you tried to uh, get that value, you would know about it. Um, so this is sort of what the insight would look like. Again, you just call it. Um, this is Lua Bridge specific. You set the result to zero and break to tell Lua Bridge that um, it successfully set a variable, um, but um, and then it can move on. Um, so this is the uh, index meta method, which is when you're trying to get a variable. Um, so we want to make sure, unlike the uh, the new index, where when you set it, um, you want to make sure nothing else has anything. Um, you want to check for your variables first um, on the index um, because if you have custom variables, it's more than likely that the variables that you're going to be working with in your component are the custom variables that you created. So you want to check them first um, just to sort of like a, a little performance thing, but you can kind of put this um, anywhere. Um, so right here in the prop get, um, again, it checks it. This is the code that it uses to actually do the internal uh, Lua bridge stuff. We insert Again, very similar looking code. We see if we have a prop custom. Um, if it exists, we push the this pointer and the variable name and we call it. And then we say that we got a result back um, just to tell Lua when uh, this function exits that a function or a value got pushed. Um, and again, this function that it internally calls will just, um, internally it'll just have a map with the name and the Lua ref of the value that it saved. Um, it'll just look up in that map and if it finds it, it'll push it out. Um, and that's it. So the last topic uh, that I'm gonna go over is performance. Um, so, let's see, yeah. Um, so before I start talking on performance, um, I should mention like pretty much any other performance warning, you're probably not gonna run into it. Lua and especially LuaJIT is really fast. Um, even with uh, Crystallite, where like I said, we had about 110 um, scripts that we were running as components, we hit 60 FPS fine on our submission. Um, so it's probably not going to become an issue, but if it does become an issue, it's probably, or it could be due to the garbage collector. Um, so for like all other performance things, if you have like a component that's taking up like a second of time where it's just doing calculations, I mean obviously you have to fix that and that's a probably a problem with your algorithm. Um, but if you get to the situation where your scripts are pretty normal, they don't have anything like really special about them, they're just a bunch of scripts, and you're starting to notice your performance um, going down, it's probably because the garbage collector. So what is the garbage collector? So the garbage collector is the awesome thing in Lua, which means that you don't have to care, care about memory. So just like in, in C++, when you want a new object, you have to call new, and you have to get the pointer and make sure that you free it up. The garbage collector does all of that for you. It manages all the memory and makes sure that you know you don't have to free things, which is one of the reasons why Lua is such a nice language to program in. Um, but it has to collect every table and every function. Um, pretty much everything that you use in Lua has to be marked and checked to see if you're still using it to see if it can clean it up. 
and that checking is slow. It's really slow. So to give you a little illustration of, of how the garbage collector does this, um, this is basically the algorithm that all garbage collectors use. Um, you can get a bit more sophisticated, but in essence, everyone has to do this. So it starts at what's known as the roots. This is all of your globals, pretty much. This is everything that you can access a global scope um, that um, basically the, the root connections where the things that basically don't have any connections, but you still need to hold on to them. So basically all your globals. So it starts at those, um, and for all those globals, it marks them and says, okay, we're still using these because they're global, so somebody might access them at some point. Um, and then for every single one of those, if it's like a table, well, it needs to go through all of the tables, keys, and values and mark those as well because it's like, okay, well, if I can access a table at global scope, that means that I should be able to access all of its values as well. Um, so it walks all those and marks all of them. Um, Finally, after going through every single table that it can possibly reach and marking all of them, um, it looks through all of its memory and says, oh, hey, this object wasn't marked, which means that there's no way that somebody can get to it because we went from everything that we could see at global scope all the way down to everything that they saw. And so if we didn't touch it, that means that it can't be reached. So we can delete it. So this is like one of the cache unfriendliest things that you can do is just walking through random memory in your program. Again, you can, like garbage collectors are good and LuaJet's garbage collector is also good. It puts them in the same place, but still walking random references can potentially point all over its memory uh, management system. And so it can be super cache unfriendly. Um, so, when you're looking at performance, again, when you're looking at a situation where most of your scripts aren't doing anything special, but your performance is still slowing down, you want to reduce the amount of garbage um, that your program is generating. Um, so uh, in my bit of research that I've done for this, I've seen pretty much three different approaches of how you deal with this. Um, we have full user data, we have um, light user data, and then we have a hybrid system. Um, so full user data, this is what pretty much every library is going to do by default because it's like the same way of doing things. So your user data, all a user data is, is it's just a block of memory that Lua knows about and it can have a meta table specific to that one thing, which is exactly what you need for a majority of your cases, right? You have your block of memory, which is gonna be like four or eight bytes for your, a pointer to your object, and then you have a meta table that you slap on it, which basically says how that pointer should react to data, like which members it has, which functions that you can call on it. Um, this is some internals for Lua Bridge. It's super easy. You take your user data, you have your size of um, user data pointer. Lua Bridge internally basically wraps your pointer to your object into a larger class so that it can do some special things with it. Um, but in essence, it's about the same. It's pointing to your object. You get the... Um, in the registry, you get the meta table that's associated with uh, this class that you're pushing out. You make sure that you got it. You set the meta table, and you're great. Um, you have your pointer with the user data on, or you have your user data with the meta table on top of it, and you can access it, you know, just like you would want to. Um, but just to show how bad this system can be, um, so we'll take something like this, which is like you have this everywhere in your script. So you have um, your owner, your owner has a transform component, so you call that. It has a position, so you get that. It's x, they have some sort of target, and so basically you want your x position to be the same as the target. So um, when you do owner.transform, it looks at transform, and it's like, hey, this is a transform class pointer. So since it's a class pointer, we need a user data for it, right? We need a pointer and a meta table for it. Same thing for transform.position. Position is a vector which is also a class, so we need a meta table for that one, uh, a block of memory and a meta table for that. Same thing with target.transform and target.position. So in this one line of code, which is like one of the simplest lines that you can write, you've created four pieces of information that Lua now needs to track and mark and make sure that you're not using it so that it can be deleted. If you can imagine and multiply this by like 100 scripts and you know, maybe like 50 lines of code for each one, you get a lot of garbage that's generated and Lua has to check each and every one to make sure that they're still not in use. Um, 
So like I said, this, is e this can easily get out of control with a lot of objects. Um, this was one of the bigger bottlenecks that we had in Crystallite. It was basically rendering our game and then this magic Lua GC function that kept showing up in our profiler, which was literally the garbage collector looking through all of these objects that we had created and at the end of the day, getting rid of them. Um, again, I put this note down here. It's probably fine for most projects that you're gonna work on here. Um, again, Crystallite still ran at 60 FPS, even with all, like, again, we used full user data, even with all of this and all the garbage collection. Like I said, Lua did, has a really good garbage collector, um, so it was able to deal with it, but again, it's, if we were scaling up to something like AAA, it probably would have become a problem. So the next approach to it is to use something called light user data. So light user data is, is a form of user data where if user data is a block of memory that Lua has to manage um, and control and can have a meta table on top of it, uh, a light user data is just that pointer. And Lua doesn't care about that pointer because it treats it basically as a stack variable. You push it and then things can like throw it around and you can throw it into a function and then when it's not in use, it doesn't care because it doesn't have a meta table or anything that needs to be tracked, it's just a pointer. Um, in fact, Lua isn't even managing um, any memory because it's not a memory block that needs to be in its memory manager. It's small enough that it can actually just be passed around in like pretty much bytecode. Um, so it doesn't need anything with it. Um, so this is what uh, the Stingray engine uses for all of their Lua code. Um, so how do they work without meta information? So how they work is you just basically control all the garbage yourself. So if you had something like a vector, instead of constructing a user data and putting it in Lua and saying, okay, Lua, I want you to control this memory, figure out when it's done and then remove it, you just do it yourself. So you um, malloc the data yourself or um, in a better case, you just have a separate giant block of memory for all the stuff that you're gonna create during one frame. Um, and you just have a simple linear allocator where you literally just move a pointer by the size that you're going to allocate. And at the end of the frame, you just move it back to the start. Um, because in essence, all of these things are temporary. A majority of the vectors that you're constructing for your game logic, you don't wanna save them. You're just going to be like, all right, I need a vector from like me to the player and then do some information on it and then I don't care about it anymore. So it'll automatically get cleaned up at the end of the frame. So you're basically controlling the garbage yourself, which means that Lua doesn't have to spend time checking through all of its roots and having more objects that it needs to do um, a complicated algorithm on to make sure that nothing is using it when you're just uh, mainly messing around with temporary objects. Um, so some obvious problems arise from, from this at first glance. So what if I need an object for more than a frame? There are some vectors that are very important and I want to be able to save them on my component and not lose them at the end of the frame. Another problem that comes up is light user data is a type. How do I know if it's like my special vector or if it's just any other pointer that's being passed around? Um, and then also, right, if we're working with vectors and we have these raw pointers, how do I do arithmetic on them? Because I don't want to have to call like vector.add and then pass in two vectors. Like that's just not syntactically nice to work with. Um, so how do I do operator over them? So let's go through each one of these. So first of all, what happens if you need an object for more than a frame? So you still have access to these full user data things and that's exactly what they're there for if you need it for more than a frame. So you just have a function that you can pass a light user data into and then out of it you'll get a full you know, block of memory that's controlled by Lua and put your memory in there just like you would do with the full user data method. Um, but the advantage of this is that you're doing it manually, so you know every single time you're calling this, you're creating something for Lua to track, um, and you can easily use this because if you're calling this function, you know that you're going to need this for more than a frame, so it's obviously something that you want, just like a table, you'd want Lua to know about and control, and you're not gonna be producing that much garbage with that. Um, so again, this is what Stingray uses. Um, they use a, a function called box and unbox, so basically you box a vector, um, and it'll convert it to a full use data and give it back, and then um, if you want to use it, you unbox it. Um, next thing, how do, how do you know if this is like a special thing, right, if this is an object or if it's just any other pointer that's being passed around, because we don't want to do 
Like when we get to operator overloading and things like that, we don't want to do operator overloading on anything. We just want to do it on the specific objects that we're controlling. Um, so the cool thing about pointers um, and the specific x86 architecture is that um, all memory has to be aligned on 32-bit boundaries. It's just a, a thing because that's how buses work. Um, and so if they're all four byte aligned, that means that you have two bits that just aren't, they're always zero because it has to be you know, 32 bit aligned. So you can use one of these bits, uh, specifically the lowest bit, in order to store whether or not this is a special pointer or not. Um, again, if you're worried about like, which you probably should be, that you know, this might not be a guarantee, you can always, um, if you write your own memory allocator, you can ensure that things are, are four byte aligned. Um, so it's a pretty easy assumption that you can make, and it's powerful because then you can mark specific pointers, and then when they get passed into functions, all you need to do is just and the lowest bit and be like, hey, is this something that I care about? And if it isn't, you just don't do anything with it. Um, so this is the same sort of uh, pushing thing. You allocate it, uh, you put your data in it. Um, in my case, I, I put the meta information um, onto the struct that I allocated, and then I, I ended, or I ordered it to set the lowest bit to mark it. And I push it up to the one. Um, finally, how do you do operator overloading? So I actually didn't know this until I started researching um, Stingray, and they mentioned this in one of their things. Um, you can actually put a meta table on light user data. The catch is, is that it's on all of light user data. So literally every single light user data shares one meta table. Um, but again, that's something that you get for free because it's sort of just like a global thing in LuaJIT that it just knows that all light user data has this one meta table that it can look for. Um, so you can treat it like any other meta table with like your add, uh, I think it, I have it here, yeah. So if you just push like a blank pointer, you can put your index, your new index, your addition, your subtraction on these light user data and it acts exactly like the other kind where like if you try and access a variable on it, it'll call the index method. Uh, if you try and set it, it'll call new index. If you try and add two light user data, it'll call this function. And again, since we've marked the light user data, we know which ones are ours so we can operate and do all these operations on them. Um, so this is just a, uh, a simple function of, of how I implemented the um, binary operator. So just like addition, subtraction, all that. Uh, with the Lewis state and the name, we get the uh, user data pointer of this function automatically, um, like checks to see if it's the one of our pointers um, and then takes off the, um, the, the lowest bit to actually get it into a correct pointer. Um, and then um, instead of going through like Lua Bridge's whole system of checking a meta table, well, we've already constructed all the metadata you know, inside of our engine, so I'll just use that instead. So I get all of the methods that are on this specific pointer, um, which is back from here. Where when I was constructing, I just a meta pointer on it. So I can get all of the different methods on it um, and then I can call the right function um, and it works with like addition, subtraction and all that. Um, so the last section, so we have the full user data where every single time you basically do anything, anytime you interact with a class, you're pushing a uh, user data and that can get out of hand. But then there's the light user data side where you have to basically manually box and unbox um, the specific light user data that you want. Um, so over winter break, I uh, basically had a project to see if I could integrate some sort of hybrid method that does both of them, basically. Um, so initially, it tries to use light user data for everything. It pushes out light user data and interacts with anything. Um, but then any time that it's actually going to use it for more than a length of time, so for instance, like the owner.transform call, that would return a light user data, and since we're not storing it anywhere, it remains a light user data and gets cleaned up at the end of the frame. Um, but for instance, if we like save it inside of a table, I detect that, and right before it sets it into the table, I quickly convert it into a full user data so that Lua can control it. Um, so like I said here, it trades off, like full, or light user data everywhere is definitely the most like performance, um, the best performance solution because you manually do each one. Um, but since I was integrating this into Crystal, I, like I said, um, we have like 100 plus scripts. There is no way I'm going to go through each one of those and be like, I need this light user data and this one. Um, so I wanted to see if I could make a system that automatically converted everything that I needed. Um, so for a system like this, 
um, here's some sort of things that you need to convert that you might not think um, that I sort of learned while doing this. So up values. So up values are all, basically when you have a function and you have global stuff above it, um, especially if this is a local, these will automatically get dragged into the function with you. Um, and you need to convert that because, again, if this is a light user data that gets cleaned up at the end of the frame, when you call this function, it'll still have a reference to that light user data that's pointing to memory that's been cleaned up, um, which is bad. So you need to convert that. Um, the other thing that you need to convert is pretty much any time you store something into a table, it's pretty likely that if you're storing it into a table, you probably want it for more than one frame. Otherwise, you wouldn't be storing it into a table. Um, so before it stores into the table, again, you need to convert it into a full user data so it sticks around for more than one frame. Um, and the last one, which was the one that I found out at the end, is that you actually also have to convert everything that's going to be stored into a local variable for a situation like this. Um, this is almost the code, um, exactly the code that I ran into that was having this problem, where we created a game object, in this case like a camera, but it was a particle system. We stored it into a local, and then we, this is inside of the middle of a coroutine, so we waited for a second. And then we tried to do something on it. So even though this is a local variable, it needs to persist through multiple frames because it's inside of a coroutine. Um, and that coroutine can persist through multiple frames. Um, so anytime a local, uh, a very, or a light user data is stored into a local variable, it also has to be converted. Um, so that sort of begs the question of how do you convert values on the fly? Um, and the simple and complicated answer of that is you basically have to modify the VM for LuaJIT. Um, because because the VM controls like all of the storing operations, you need to go into where it's actually storing the value into the table, and then right before it does it, you need to call your own function that quickly um, converts it into a full user data, and then passes that back as the one to actually set into the table. Um, the tricky part about that is that it's sort of in the middle of execution which means you can't touch the stack because if you do, like it was relying on the stack being exactly the same like throughout that operation that it's doing. So for instance, if you do something like, if you call the normal function to push a user data, um, by default, it pushes that onto the stack. And because it does that, it messes up the entire execution of the rest of the program because again, it was expecting the stack to be in a very specific order. Um, so that makes the conversion function a bit tricky because you basically have to convert a light user data into a full user data, but you can't touch the stack at all, um, which basically results in using a bunch of internal LuaJIT functions instead of the C API that they provide you. Um, this whole, like modifying the VM basically requires its own talk. Um, I'd be happy to compile that and give it. Um, so uh, feel free to email me um, if you want specifics on it. Um, but the upside of this method, so I was able to get it done over winter break, and I got this whole conversion thing working, and I didn't have to touch a single script in all of Crystallite. All of these hundred scripts that we had, I didn't have to touch any of them, and we got like 35% performance improvement pretty much for free just by not, you know, from all those temporary garbage that we were throwing at Lua, by just not having that, we got a lot of performance out of it. Um, in my test, it was about 14 milliseconds down to about 10. Um, so, at the end of all this performance stuff, again, full user data is like fine for 90% of the things that you're going to do. Um, make sure the garbage collection is actually the problem, because if it's just like a really long algorithm that's not good, it, I mean, this isn't going to help you at all. Um, the light user data method is actually really good if you start with it, because again, it's manually deciding whether or not you want an object to live for more than one frame. And if you start off your project with it, it's manageable because you, you know, every new script you write, you can just have in your head, like which, which of these things do I want to save for more than a frame? Um, unfortunately, with a project like Crystallite, something that's already established and has a large code base, this just isn't feasible um, because there's just, there is pretty much guaranteed going to be an edge condition somewhere that you forgot to save a variable. Um, so the automatic conversion was pretty much the the only way to do it um, for a project like that. Um, that's the end of my talk. So, any questions?
And again, feel free. I'll probably post this these slides um, at some point soon. And feel free to contact me if you have any questions.